everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I want to go over hyperphosphatemia. In my previous video I went over hypophosphatemia, so if you're interested in that video be sure to check that out. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to cover the causes, the signs and symptoms, and the nursing interventions. And I'm going to give you some clever mnemonics on how to remember these things for your NCLEX exam and your nursing lecture exams. Now, after this video, be sure to go to my website, registerednursern.com, and take the free quiz that goes along with this video. It's going to test your knowledge on hyper and hypophosphatemia. Okay, first let's break down this big long word and see what electrolyte we're dealing with and if we're in a high or low state. So the first part of the word is hyper, and it means excessive. And phosphat is the prefix for phosphate, so we already know that we're dealing with electrolyte phosphate and it's in an excessive state and emia means blood so when you put all that together you get high phosphate in the blood now what is a normal phosphate level you want to know this because on exams it's going to throw lab values out at you and you need to know is this normal is this not normal so 2.7 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter is that normal range and anything greater than 4.5 is considered hypophosphatemia now, before you can truly understand the causes and the signs and symptoms of why a patient with a high FOS level is presenting with this, you have to know how phosphate plays a role in the body. Where is it stored and things like that. So, phosphate helps build bones in your teeth. So, anything that is, a, if you have low phosphate, like we talked in the other video, you are at a huge risk of bone fractures so you have to watch that and it plays a role in your nerve and muscle function so whenever you get too high of phosphate levels you can have hyperactive deep tendon reflexes and when you get low phosphate you have that muscle pain how we were talking about in rhabdomyolysis and things like that and Phosphate is mainly stored in your bones and this is super important remember this next part your kidneys and your parathyroid regulate your FOS levels. And as I'm going to talk about here in a second, anything that is affecting the kidneys, especially the kidneys, you are going to have some mess up phosphate levels. So remember that. And calcium and phosphate influence each other in opposite ways. So if you have low calcium levels, you're probably going to have high phosphate levels and vice versa. They're, they're always in a constant opposite way. And vitamin D, another important part, plays a huge role in how you absorb phosphate. So if you have low vitamin D, you're probably not going to be taking in as much phosphate. If you have too much vitamin D, you've used too much vitamin D supplement, you may have a high phosphate because it's absorbed a lot of it. So let's go and talk about the causes of a high phosphate level. Okay, this mnemonic I wanted to develop this mnemonic so it can help you learn your nursing interventions. And the mnemonic I have is FOSHI, P-H-O-S-H-I. Okay, this goes along with a very important drug called FOSLO, P-H-O-S-L-O, which is also calcium acetate. And this is a phosphate binding drug that is given to patients in end-stage renal failure that they take with their meals. It works with the GI system to help keep phosphate levels low and it's excreted in the stool. So because a patient who's in renal failure, whenever they eat foods that are high in phosphorus, they are huge risk of keeping that because those kidneys are not getting rid, rid of phosphorus. So remember that because this is going to help you with the nursing interventions of why we're giving a patient FOS low. So remember FOS high for causes. Okay, typically whenever a patient is having a high phosphate level, it's because the kidneys aren't working. That is usually 99% of the reason a FOS level would be high. So let that is really what's part of all this. So just remember that. If you can remember kidneys, you can remember the causes of a high phosphate level. Okay, first part, P. 
Phosphosoda overuse. What is this? This is your laxatives and enemas that contains phosphate, such as your Fleet's enema or your sodium phosphate enemas. And um, you never want to give these to patients who have renal problems because what it's going to do is it's going to increase those phosphate levels because their kidneys can't get rid of the phosphorus and you're going to send them into hyperphosphatemia. Okay, H hypoparathyroidism. Now in hypophosphatemia, we said hyperparathyroidism caused it. Now this is the opposite. Hypoparathyroidism is causing increased phos levels. And this is due to the parathyroid gland releases a hormone called PTH, parathyroid hormone, and it's decreased. The secretion is decreased. That's where you're getting your hypo of this word. And normally your parathyroid hormone maintains your calcium and your phosphate levels. And this normally inhibits the reabsorption of phosphate. So it's just keeping those levels nice and steady. But whenever you have a lot of parathyroid hormone being pumped out into the body, the kidneys start to just keep all that phosphate and it rises the levels. So that's what's happening with that. Okay, oh, for overuse of vitamin D, say you took too many supplements or something like that, um, what's going to happen is that the body is going to absorb too much phosphorus because vitamin D is helping with that. So that's one cause. S for syndrome of tumor lysis. This happens whenever a patient is um, receiving chemotherapy for cancer because the goal of chemo is to go in and kill all those cells. But unfortunately, chemo kills good cells as well. And whenever it's killing those cells, because remember, inside the cell, which is intracellularly, you have phosphorus. And whenever you're killing, you have phosphorus, sodium, potassium, all these wonderful electrolytes. Whenever you're killing that cell, it's opening up and it's, lysis, it's lysising and all this phosphorus and all these other electrolytes are just entering into the blood system which is rising your phosphate levels. So that is what's happening. Those intracellular contents is being dumped into the blood. Next, the H, the word that I use for this is the rhabdomyolysis and I use the H for the part of the high. And this, we talked about this in hypophosphatemia, but this is where you have rapid necrosis um, of the muscles. They're just breaking down rapidly. And whenever they're breaking down those muscles, because inside your muscles you have myoglobulin, and that's being released into the blood, which it shouldn't be, because whenever it goes through the kidneys, gets filtered through the kidneys, it's very toxic to the kidneys and it causes the kidneys to start to shut down and this sends the patient into renal failure and remember any type of kidney problems will affect phosphate levels so all of a sudden you're going to be in renal failure because of this myoglobulin being released into the body and the excretion of phosphate is going to be decreased so you're going to keep all this phosphate in your body and then the last one is eye insufficiency of the kidneys and like i've been talking about up here um, patients who are in stage renal failure you really have to watch um, what they're eating because they don't need to eat foods high in phosphorus um, because they're not excreting the phosphorus so you have to watch any patients with renal issues with that Okay, now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of hyperphosphatemia. Okay, now remember how we talked about over here that calcium and phosphate influence each other in opposite ways. So whenever you have a high phosphate level, you are going to have low calcium levels. So you're going to have hypocalcemia. And how your patient's going to be presenting, because you're going to have both of these electrolyte balances going on, you're going to see a lot of the same signs and symptoms that you would in a patient with hypocalcemia. So remember the mnemonic cramps. It's the same mnemonic we use for hypocalcemia. And they're going to be confused. They're going to have reflexes that are very hyperactive, those deep tendon. They're going to have anorexia, A. They're going to have M, muscle spasms in their calves, their feet, tetany seizures, they're going to be jerking, moving, and P, positive trousseau sign, and remember from that video, um, in order to check for a positive trousseau sign, you put a blood pressure cuff on the upper arm, you inflate it for three to five minutes, keep it there, um, you inflate it above their systolic, about 10 to 20 points, hold it there for at least three to five minutes, and then all of a sudden, involuntarily, if the patient has a low calcium level, you're going to see their hands start to do this involuntarily, the patient is not doing it, it just starts moving. 
and that's a muscle spasm of that and that's positive that's a very good sign of a low calcium level and then s signs of Chavotsky's the Chavotsky sign this is where you um hit you test the facial nerve at the masseter muscle right here at the angle of the jaw you just tap that and what will happen on this same side that you tapped, you'll have twitching of the nose and, or the mouth, and that's just signifying the low calcium level. So that is what that is. Now let's look at the nursing intervention. Okay, this is what you wanna do as a nurse, things you wanna watch out for. Okay, this first point is gonna go back to our mnemonic. Remember the FOSS high for the causes of hyperphosphatemia? Well, this is where we hit on the FOSS low to help you remember. Okay, you're gonna be administering those phosphate binding drugs, which is Foslo, um, calcium acetate, which is the generic word. And this works on the GI system. And what happens is that the patient eats, you give them their Foslo or right after they eat, and it will help absorb that phosphorus that they don't need already because they're in renal failure and it will be excreted into the stool. So you want to make sure that you give these medications the phosphate bonding medications with food or right after a meal. That's usually a test question that professors love to hit on, so make sure you know that. Um, don't give them any phosphate laxatives or enemas. Remember, we talked about how that affects the body, it affects those phosphate levels. And you want to restrict foods that are high in phosphorus. If you've ever worked on a renal floor, every patient is on the renal diet. They absolutely hate it. It's a very bland diet other than the cardiac diet. So you want to know foods that are high in phosphorus that you don't want that patient to get. Because you will get scenarios where it'll say you're doing some diet teaching with a patient who has a high phosphorus level. What statement by the patient makes you need to re-educate them because this food is high in phosphorus? So foods high in phos are fish, nuts, chicken, beef, pork, organ meats, and whole grains. So pretty much meats in general and um, those whole grains are high. And next, usually if the patient is in renal failure, you're gonna have to provide, um, prepare them for dialysis to help get that phosphate level down. Okay, so that's a little bit about hyperphosphatemia. Now be sure to go to my website, registerednursern.com and take that free quiz to test your knowledge on hyper and hypophosphatemia. And thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.